would leave you, go off and talk in this room, and then come back with a unified message for you. Don't expect them to be real chatty. Don't expect them to be real friendly, because they're there. Keep in mind, procurement integrity exists. They're not supposed to have you have a whole lot of conversations with you, but a live test demonstration is a unique situation. But they don't want you to, they don't want any company to feel like they're being overly friendly because they don't want anybody to think they have an unfair advantage over um, Move through the agenda, stick to your script. Uh, you'll see them taking notes throughout the process, um, and you'll also see them getting up and doing this caucus stuff. Uh, know that they have to agree on the technical scores for you, or they have to you know, explain themselves. They might have reason to go off. Um, in other words, they want to present a unified front to you. So they may need to go off and figure out what that unified front is before they come back to you. They'll tend to limit their conversations with you. They typically won't tell you whether you passed or failed, but you can kind of get a sense that if the, if the live test demonstration was supposed to go six hours and you're finished in four hours, you probably have done some things right, or you've done things <laughs> so bad that they've decided to put um, But you can get a good sense of what you did. They'll issue you a report several days later to let you know what you did. Any questions about live test demonstration? Another thing the government can do is use oral proposal presentations. And they can use this in different ways. They can either um, uh, ask you to present your whole solution orally in addition to your written proposal. And I don't know if I know why they do that. Or they can say, I don't even want a written proposal. Just give us an oral proposal. Um, in either of those situations, they take you. So you need to be, you know, make sure your people all feel comfortable with that and be prepared for them. They use these proposal presentations. First off, they use it to find out who they're going to be working with. You know, how, how, do you seem knowledgeable? Do you know what you're talking about? You know, if I ask you questions, can you respond to them? Or are you, you know, are you talking down to me? Or, you know, how, what, how's that working relationship? Um, they also verify that the team will be working on can answer these ad hoc questions because that's what real life is, these ad hoc questions. And then to gain a better solution of this, better understanding of the solution that you're proposing. Because they can, instead of just reading the written word, they can actually talk to you about it. So this is another option, oral proposals. Same kind of preparation as if you had live test demonstrations. Um, the only thing is you don't have to put components together. This is strictly a kind of a PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Um, government site visits. So they use government site visits to figure out if what you're saying in the proposal is true. And what they're really looking at is, you know, are you a mom and pop storefront that's talking as if you're a $500 billion company? You know, so they want to come into your facility, just like those of you who have gone to visits to General Dynamics or Komatsu, you get a real sense of what those organizations are all about when you get there. You see, when you look through their, their manufacturing, you get a sense of what they do well, you get a sense of what they don't do so well where they put their, their money and where they put their funds. Uh, the government does the same thing. So what they do is they have a standard form of different things that they might want to see. They could check all of them, they could check two of them. Um, what you need to do is take that list, whatever's on it, and go find that information in your company. And it can be things like quality assurance plans, it can be your letters from the corporation that you're a company, it can be, um, uh, maybe some sort of uh, system backup plans, whatever they're interested in for your particular procurement, you should go find those within your organization. And this is the situation that I talked about yesterday. Your best bet is to do what? The test. Put them in a binder and do what? Hand it to them in the lobby. Hand it to them in the lobby, right? That's your easiest way to get through an audit. Um, now, they may want to sit down with you and just flip through your binder to make sure you've included everything so that they have warm fuzzies that they've got all your information. But that's a much better approach than they walk in, you have a blank desk, and you say, okay, let me go talk to Joe about item one. You know? That's not right. Um, capability maturity models. Okay, so uh, remember I told you the history of quality where we used to just kind of figure out what buzzwords the government were using this year by going to conferences, and then we'd sprinkle those words and 
we never paid any more attention to quality and the government never paid any attention to quality and that's how we, we ran things. We don't do that anymore, right? The government has a lot of wasted do taxpayers' dollars because of that approach. You know, contractors have taken advantage of the government, committed fraud in a lot of cases because of that approach. So now what happens is you, as you start to see all these bubble up security, uh, quality control measures. So you see things like Lean Six Sigma. You see things like ISO certification. Those are all quality standards, right? To show that you have taken the effort to make sure that you have consistent processes in place, that everyone's using them, everyone knows about them and is using them, and that you can produce consistent results because of them. That's what the government's looking for. They want you to be able to produce here, not have these flagrant ones all off uh, that are outside of variance. Okay? So these quality control measures aren't at the very end of this product, I'm going to check to see if this pen right screen, has black writing, and has a green canister. That's, we talk about that as being, you know, bolted on at the end. No, that's not what quality control is about anymore. Quality control is back here in the design phase. What do we need to do to make sure our drawings are accurate? What do we do, need to do to make sure our drawings are secure? That's good. Hence the whole cybersecurity discussion. How, how do we know that somebody hasn't hacked into our systems and modified those drawings? Because if we manufacture those drawings that are incorrect, we may have all of a sudden put a, some, a bug in there that the Chinese government can, can look at our, or hear what's happening in our systems. And if you think this stuff doesn't happen, they work with a lot of doctoral students on their dissertations. There was somebody who has every reason to know. In other words, their, their job is to do this. They told me that Obama's plane had been grounded twice while it was in air, because something, someone, some entity had taken over the controls of the plane. If they can hack into the federal, into the president's plane, and I don't know if any of you have been out to Andrews and actually have seen this plane and all that, I, mean, they, I just heard about the security that they'll tell the public about, plus all the things they won't tell the public about. If they can hack into that plane, they can hack into every single thing. So my point is, if it can be that serious at that level, and they literally have to ground the plane to be able to, to solve the issue, that's why you need to take cybersecurity so it um, can't get so serious. So these capability maturity models um, started off in the software engineering world, but now they've started permeating everything. Acquisition, outsourcing, human resources, all these different fields. And what a capability maturity model is, is it typically has five levels. Remember we drew it? Level one was like chaos. By number level two, you had some repeatable processes. By level three, people were all using them. By level four, you were starting to collect metrics on those um, uh, metrics on those quality uh, standards. And by level five, you were like optimized. You, you, know, you had it all together. Um, not all organizations need to be at a level five. But for the government, most the government says most uh, organizations have to be at a level three. So think about the example: if I'm a mother and there's a fire in my house and I have a baby, what do I have to do? Run, get the baby, run out of the house. But if I have a daycare of 90 kids and um, 30 workers, now all of a sudden we've got to have a different process in place because my methodology is not going to work. So that's why the government does require level five for everyone. So what do they? What do you have to do as a contractor? We have to figure out which capability model, model, uh, maturity model the government's paying attention to, because it could be human resources, it could be outsourcing, it could be whatever, and what level they want contractors to attain. Usually it's level three, and then get the questionnaire or checklist from Carnegie Mellon that says. This is the checklist you use to determine what your capability maturity model is for that element. And um, the one for system engineering, for example, has like 90 questions. And they're all yes no questions. Do you have a security plan? Do you have a capability, I mean, um, do you have a, a configuration management plan? Do you conduct peer reviews? Do you have senior leadership sign off on your work? And all you do is say yes or no to each of these. And then, um, Based on your number of yes answers, you can be at a level one, two, three, four, or five. And so let's say that you go in and you, 
you answer enough yeses that you can get a level three. Okay, that's right. So now you're at a level three. In order to move up to a level four, what do you have to do? To get from level three to level four? Get more yeses. So you look at the list of things you're saying no to, figure out how you can turn them into yeses. Okay, so now that's what we do as contractors. What does the government do? They say, okay, for this particular RFP, we're going to pay attention to capability model, maturity model, or systems uh, integration, and we want level three. And they put that level in the RFP as a requirement. So you can't bid on this unless you meet that level three certification, right? Um, so we all submit our proposals. We, we identified in our company we're in a level three. Now we're, we've submitted our proposal. The government sends an auditor to our location. And they say, okay, you said you had a, a system security plan. Let me see it. You said you had a configuration management plan. Let me see it. Um, Don, did you review Marianne's work? Because you said you had peer reviews. Let me see your notes from her, from her last review. So basically, they're validating that what you've said you had in place, you actually have in place. After they finish their audit, guess what? Maybe some of your yeses were really no's, that they, you didn't really have enough in place to handle it. So now the government says, no, you're, you're certified at level two, and guess what? You're no longer eligible for this, this RFP, so they downselect you. So this is a way of helping companies take on the, the burden and the responsibility of ensuring that um, you have quality built in throughout the process. Um, and then the last thing that we talk about is final proposal revision. So after you conduct discussions with the production, okay. yeah. um, so now let's say you conduct your discussions uh, with the government. So the government picks three companies maybe and says, can you come in for discussions? Maybe they only pick one. And you come in and you, they give you a list of items for negotiation and you prepare your responses to each of those. You also respond with your own questions to the government. The idea at the end of, of discussions or negotiations is that you have a meeting of minds between you and the government. Now what happens is they come back and they say to you, okay, fine, we'd like you to submit a final proposal revision. They used to call this best and final offer, uh, BAFO, or now they call it final proposal revision. What do you have to do to prepare for that? This is going to be your final, this is it, our bottom line offer back to you, government. So what do you do to be able to do that? You have to develop and negotiate your subcontracts because you don't want to give the government a final price if you don't have subcontractors giving you a final price because there could be a disconnect. You develop and negotiate your internal agreements. Like if you have an engineering department and you want to make sure that they know what they're stepping up to to be able to help you be compliant. Um, if the government has service level agreements where they say you have to be within a certain variance of this, how do you, what are those service level agreements? Or maybe providing a certain level of response time to customers. Make sure that you take all that into account because that has a dollar, a dollar amount associated with providing that. Um, what are the acceptance criteria? What are the liquidated damages? These are all things that you want to make sure you know and have a dollar amount associated with so that you can give them your final price. You have to understand what the contract baseline is, every single component that you're providing. You have to understand the UCC and the FAR clauses and understand how they impact your world. You have to understand any flowdowns that you flow down to your subcontractors. Have they stepped up to them? Well, the answer is, did they, did they negotiate the subcontract with you? Um, and then you, you prepare, conduct, and follow through on proposal discussions, and you conduct those pro proposal discussions. Again, discussions is the same word as negotiations in the commercial marketplace. But discussions for the government start as soon as you get clarifications or efficiencies, and they go through the actual either face-to-face -face or over the phone discussions. Then you uh, prepare and submit your final proposal revision. So you get all your final prices from subcontractors. You get all your final prices from internal support groups. Um, you want to make sure that you understand the sales and the CEO's perspective about how to price this deal. Remember I told you that a lot of times numbers bubble up from the bottom? 
that are pretty realistic, and then the CEO says, reduce it by 10% because we're not going to win at that level. That's what's happening here. Make sure your proposal is accurate and complete. Because if it's not accurate and complete, the government can't make an award decision. Make sure you're not taking exceptions to terms and conditions. Why am I telling you not to take exceptions to terms and conditions? Because <coughs> other people want it and you might get thrown to the side. Exactly. Right? They, they typically have more than three bidders putting in proposals. And if you're the only one taking exception, they can always go to the other vendors to make an award decision. So that's the risk you take when you take exception. Redo the pricing information with all this new information. Typically, this is the only thing you have to change at this point. Conduct a compliance check to make sure everything is working correctly. And then prepare uh, to submit to the government. The, clear, the um, final proposal revision has the same rules as the initial proposal. You have to submit it on time and by this exact date. Because otherwise, you'll be non-compliant. And then one last thing I wanted to talk about just for a second is procurement integrity. Um, keep in mind that the government's goal is to keep the playing field level between vendors um, and, and to avoid the perception that it's not level. So, um, you know, if I'm a contracting officer and I know you're bidding on this and I have lunch with you and you see it, you're going to say, oh, she's probably getting a, an unfair advantage than I am because they're having lunch together. So the government really restricts communication with vendors from the time of um, the time of release of an RFP through submit, uh, through final um, award. Um, typically, uh, so questions have to be asked within the first ten days of a submit of a RFP being released. So if you don't get a chance to look at your inbox till day eleven, you've lost your chance at asking questions. You want to make sure that you pay attention to that deadline. And then they typically don't take calls or emails or um, visits from you when a solicitation is in the process because, again, it's a perception issue. Um, it's in your best interest to ask any question you have within the first 10 days because otherwise you look like you're a contractor who doesn't know what they're going to fill out market space. Okay? Any questions about that? I believe we're at an end. We are because the clipper doesn't work anymore. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, anything wrap up for today? Anybody still alive out there on TV land? I'll see you guys tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.